when Britain's citizens voted on leaving the European Union, far-right nationalist groups insisted that legal immigrants and people of color did not deserve to vote because they were no longer legitimate citizens of the nation. It's easy to see why they would believe this, considering that the primary reason that Britain left was a result of the superiority they felt to other nations in the European Union. Because we on side proposition believe that there's a sharp distinction between loving one's country and loathing another's, we are proud to propose today's motion, Global Nationalism Threatens Global Stability. I'm going to first present a few points of framing in this speech before moving on to our first two substantive arguments. Firstly, that nationalism increases militarism, and secondly, that it threatens the well-being of other minorities, before my partner Shreyoshi presents the third argument in her speech. But two points of framing first. Our stance in this round is very clear. We support pride in one's country, but we don't support more extreme nationalist sentiments of superiority. Why is this true? Firstly, we think that nationalism as it's defined, as we would normally think of it, is a sense of consciousness, a national one, exalting one's own nation above all others and by placing a primary emphasis on the promotion of its culture, interests, and specific policies as opposed to those of other nations. To be clear, however, there's a difference between nationalism and patriotism. We think that I can have pride in my own country in the United States but I don't have to feel superior to those in Europe, for example. But the second point of framing is based on the definition of global stability, as it is a period of peace throughout history. That being said, we think that the burden of side opposition is to prove that there are benefits to nationalism that further stability while we would have to prove the opposite. And with that, our first substantive argument is that global nationalism increases militaristic policies. Two layers here. Firstly, about interstate aggression. We think that nationalism is tied with these notions of pride for one's country that go overboard, which often lead to feelings of superiority, aggression, sure. overconfidence, and even military antagonisms. Celebrating your own identity at the expense of others often involves antagonizing an enemy, some sort of rival country. For example, Russia's national holiday celebrating the victory over the Poles is associated with Russian marches, namely carrying swastikas or chanting Russia for Russians along with other anti-Muslim and anti-Jewish slogans. However, the problem with this is that certain citizens, Muslims, immigrant workers, are often blamed for those corruptions, scapegoated for crime, as well as dead-end jobs. This means two things. Firstly, that countries Sir. become more uncooperative in the process. For example, Chinese state-controlled media manipulated nationalist tensions to justify canceling the diplomatic efforts with the Japanese prime minister. At the point of which these nations are refusing to even talk to one another, we think that's a major problem and roadblock to international relations. But secondly, we think it's also important to recognize the aggression that nationalism promotes. Countries have violated other countries' sovereignty in the past because they feel that they have a sudden right to their territory because of nationalist sentiments. Point. For example, Russia annexed Crimea because on the belief that Crimea was rightfully theirs. But on that account, those territories are simply part of this nationalist sentiment of control and domination. But I'll take your point. Yeah. More nationalism, like the one in the UK that you bring up, is more about independence and isolationism than having to expand on other territory. Um, sure. So like independence, however, is distinct from nationalist sentiments. Again, like remember the distinction between patriotism, which is pride for one's countries, and a sense of independence. We think that's different. We don't object to that. In fact, we think that's perfectly fine that you can be proud of your country. The problem that we do have is when those sentiments of patriotism turn into more nationalist or extremist notions, which often involve violence, as you'll see in the second layer, which concerns intrastate conflicts. Nationalism creates violence at the point which one country is fractured along different ethnic, religious, as well as sexual lines. For example, Hindu versus Muslim nationalism in India has caused a constant power struggle within a state, asserting with both sides, saying that this nation belongs only to one religion. However, not only would we object to that on principle, we also see pragmatic consequences excluding one side of the discussion. Firstly, we think that there is sectarian violence where Hindu nationalists threaten to behead the Pekinese Khan because they disagree with her movie. Just because India's extremist Rajput's cat group, Karni Sana, has threatened to burn down British cinemas that even began to show that film. Not only does this promote a culture of bigotry and violence, it also promotes hate crimes, where nationalism has involved in exclusion of different people who don't belong to the rightful nation. 
For example, when Richard Spencer, a white nationalist in our home country, claims that white America is under attack by the diversity of immigrant labor, as well as minorities, factions growing in the United States, we further sure. recognize that this only legitimizes violence like those in Charlottesville, where one woman and 30 people were injured, simply because a white person decided that those people were not legitimate aspects of our nation's identity. Our second substantive is about how nationalism threatens the well-being of marginalized groups. Two layers again. Firstly, we think it promotes its us-versus-them mentality. Nationalism typically affects minorities the most because nationalists only see people who are within their nation as equals to the view of immigrants as outsiders, creating an attachment of negative stigma to those of foreigners. For example, Marine Le Pen's France's national far-right party uses anti-refugee rhetoric to simply attract voters, where the success of their party often depends on extreme scapegoating, fear-mongering, and xenophobic rhetoric resonating with people across Europe. We think this is immensely problematic because it excludes certain perspectives from the discussion. When immigrant voices are no longer heard, when certain people are no longer included within the marketplace of ideas, we think that undermines the diversity of our democracy and the potential for bringing up different solutions to our political problems. Our second layer here is concerning the denyment of the right to self-identification. We think nationalism necessarily puts the interests of one country before those of others, deeming other notions of other nations' identity as illegitimate. For example, Catalonia and Spain's conflict of separatism has revived Spanish nationalism because of the urge to cling to power and has caused riots in the streets, political instability as Madrid literally acts as a dictator to control Catalonia's secessionist parties of nationalist tendencies. This not only manipulates the wishes of the people, it prevents them from actually attaching their culture, their background, denying them the ability to even access and celebrate their family history. At the end of the day, great nationalism is not justified and threatens global stability, and thus we are proud to propose. Your pride for your country should not come after your country becomes great. Your country becomes great because of your pride in it. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'll begin my speech by making a small clarification in our stance in today's debate. We support civil nationalism, where the nation is not based on common ancestry or ethnicity, but is a political entity with common culture and values, where individuals subscribe to basic political ideas to belong to the nation. We do not defend the impact of identity politics, which they have talked about, where the nation is built on unchangeable characteristics like ethnicity or religion. Now, why are we debating this today? Because throughout modern history, nationalism has been a driving force behind the creation of states around each nationality. Today, new challenges are leading to a resurgence of nationalism in the US, Europe, and certain parts of Asia. Now, in order to win this debate, Team Proposition will have to prove two things. First, that nationalist solutions for current problems intrinsically generate conflict and disruption. And second, that the alternative of internationalism Sorry. is a better alternative for global stability, since those uh, are the only uh, the, the, the two options uh, that we're considering. Now, in order to prove our case, we'll present three main arguments. First, united we fell. Second, it's not you, it's me. And third, pledge of alliance. But before that, I would like to repeat some of the points presented by the first speaker of Team Proposition. They told us that nationalism inherently leads to feelings of superiority, while patriotism is uh, very nice and it's all about the love of your country. So basically what they're saying is, they're taking these two synonyms and they're saying, uh, one is all good, the other is all bad, and so nationalism has all of the bad connotations of, uh, nation of nationalism, Sorry. and patriotism is all of the good. So basically they're saying, look at all of the terrible things that nationalism has, has created, that is what team uh, opposition is trying to uh, defend. That is not the case, ladies and gentlemen. As we, as we said before, we are not for identity politics. We are for nationalism, that is, love of your country, that is the Please. good and the bad. That is, in, in, some, in some situations, it does lead to some problems, but overall, overwhelmingly, this creates uh, a feeling of, uh, of, of, of trying to actually work better for your country and being, having independence, which actually creates um, uh, international stability. So nationalism is about the love of your country as well, not just patriotism. On that point. They also told us that nationalism leads people to hate on minorities and immigrants. Now, this is not necessarily the case. We see that racism is actually largely independent from nationalism. Because racist uh, ideas and racist beliefs 
do not stem from the love of your country. They stem from hatred. They stem from uh, intolerance. And maybe so, there's nationalism can, uh, in, in some situations, be expressed as the excuse uh, in order for these hatred to be expressed. But by no means it, it is the cause of it. So people hate on minorities and hate on immigrants, not because of their, the law of their country, but because they do so uh, because they are intolerant. So nationalism doesn't cause this problem. It's, it's just a, a reflection of sir. it. So nationalism can actually, in many cases, lead to accepting immigrants. We see the example of the American dream, where people like are, uh, immigrants are seen uh, coming, coming into America as a, into a, a new place of opportunity, yes, where they can actually uh, get a better life. And this is a very positive form of nationalism that actually helps immigrants. Before you move on. But beginning with my first argument, United We Fell, on the rise of international, on, on uh, why the rise of internationalism has placed countries in a position where they have lost independence, threatening global stability. So let's look at what is the problem nowadays. Over the last decades, countries have around the world have moved towards closer political links and unions with the aims of improving relations and getting collective benefits. We see the example of the European Union, NATO, Point. many other uh, unions around the world. Now, this has limited the ability of nation states to take measures on their own and decide over important aspects. For example, in Europe, members of the EU must follow its regulations on a range of subjects with very little room for objections. Moreover, individual citizens feel that they lose the possibility of influencing their own lives as decisions are made, decisions are made in a distant place with very little input from them. This reduction of sovereignty creates disillusion and frustration, eventually leading to instability. Furthermore, increasing integration has given way to more friction between countries, because as states are forced to, uh, to follow policies that they may not agree with, resentment grows towards those other states pushing for those policies which are being imposed in them. So, for example, we see uh, NATO members, which are not, many of them, not fulfilling the 2% of uh, GDP military spending uh, target. This has caused tensions between the US and Europe, and Trump calling NATO obsolete, clearly uh, international disruption and instability. But how does nationalism help solve these problems? Believing that global stability is under threat because of nationalism is a misunderstanding of the cause and effect relation between these two phenomena. Nationalism stems from people's desire to prioritize the interests of their own country in the middle of crisis situations such as those arising after the failures of internationalism. We see, for example, the European Union's inability to properly manage the refugee crisis or NATO's obsolescence or pushing countries to adopt the nationalist agenda rather than being a consequence of leaders looking Sir. inwards. So nationalism seeks self-sufficiency and therefore minimizes the impact of these crisis situations as each country can execute policies tailored to their specific needs, uh, they avoid being dragged down unnecessarily. But you disagree. On your definition of civil nationalism, there are different identities within a different state, often cultural, religious, as well as ethnic differences. I How do you reconcile them with You reconcile them behind the core principles of democracy and the, whole, the core values of a country. For example, in the United States, that would be liberty, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those main values, if you don't, do not subscribe to those main values, then, then you, 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 you cannot be considered part of the American nation. As long as you consider, uh, as, as long as you subscribe to those values, we do not care you, about your ethnicity or your, your religion, you are completely welcome. So a nationalist trend also has the benefit of avoiding the tensions created by internationalism. So since countries no longer have to argue and create policies that, that, that pointlessly try to accommodate opposing uh, interests, they can actually get together better. But in a second argument, let's look at the economic problems. Economic integration has failed to create conditions of stability through social and economic progress because of many reasons. Um, for example, uh, countries have to take economic policies in, 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 um, in together, and so this creates problems. For example, the European Central Bank can only place one set of interest rates, yet the inflation goals of Germany and Greece could not be more different. So this leads to increasing tensions and compromises being made, for example, leading to crisis. We see the example of the Greek crisis, which led to an incredible destabilization of the Eurozone. Nationalism, on the other hand, brings uh, economic independence and isolates countries so that when there is a crisis situation in one country, first of all, it is much harder, much, much easier to deal with because they have more independence to do so. Second of all, it doesn't affect other countries. It, the, the, the problem in one country does not uh, actually impact uh, all of the surrounding countries. So by removing from these uh, integrated blocks, we're actually creating more stability in the process. For all, for all these reasons, we believe that you should ask not what your country can do for you, you should ask what you can do for your country. Thank you very much. The first time I've heard civil nationalism was in the last speech because really that kind of term doesn't exist. 
Instead, we call that patriotism. The reason that we have the term nationalism is because it is specifically catered to what nationalist movements now look like. That's why we draw a distinction between what it means to simply be proud of your country and to want to defend your country, and a distinction to people who take it to the extreme, who disparage other countries and isolate themselves and use horrible rhetoric to lift up their own native country. The latter is what we have an issue with. The latter is what nationalism looks like. When you look at the world today, when you look at international nationalist movements like the ones in France, like the ones that are here at home, like the ones that are overseas in other European countries, tensions are rising and global stability is very clearly being threatened. In the speech, I'm going to be first responding to the material that we heard outside opposition. And then I will be presenting the third substantive argument coming out of side proposition side of the house. So when you look at their arguments on side opposition, really the big one that they have is that it is a good thing for you to defend your own country and to have pride in your country. We agree with that general premise, but we don't think nationalism refers to that, right? We think that nationalism is actually people who are on the more extreme side of things. And instead of actually using more peaceful methods or civil methods huh. of engaging with what they're in, of engaging and lifting up their country, they're trying to disparage other countries uh, in terms of doing it. What we think is that even if nationalism means a love of your country, when it's taken to the extreme, all it causes is an increase in tensions. We saw a great example of this that Brian told you, with the example of Russia. They have a national holiday that literally uses disparaging rhetoric about Poland because Russia had victory over Poland. But instead of patriotism, where Russia would have been proud of the fact that it won the war, but would not disrespect Poland, a lot of the times what happens is that in those marches, you have people that are using very offensive rhetoric to talk, to, to, to talk about the Poles. We think that that is what nationalism looks like. Wow. Because when you think about it, what is actually contentious in the world today, right? Nationalism wouldn't be contentious if people were being super peaceful about it and were using civil discourse. No, it is because there are people that are being offensive, that are causing tensions, that are causing countries to isolate themselves. That is why we're having this debate. That is why we are wondering, is nationalism actually threatening global stability? Because what happens is the second key assumption that they make with all of their arguments is that somehow cooperating with other countries is a bad thing. This is their second argument. We have several points of contestation with Men. this. The first is that they say that things like economic integration have caused a decrease in stability. We ask them why. We see that instead, by having countries that are globally interconnected with the economy, you have a much stronger global economy. The reason for this is because countries can exchange goods and services. People in one country that perhaps doesn't have a certain good, for example, in the United States, we don't necessarily get bananas domestically, we import them from Jamaica. So when we have a lack of economic cooperation, you lose out on getting these goods and services that you wouldn't have been able to get otherwise. The second key harm with isolating yourself from other countries is that now, if your economy collapses, if you have political harms, if you need help from other countries, you can't get it. Countries are failing on their own. We need to be united as an international community to make sure all countries have the same ability to be prosperous. That is how we create an international community that is strong. That's why we, we, what we saw when Greece, when their economy collapsed, Germany was able to bail them out. Well, Greece um, otherwise would have had much more poverty, would have been much worse off if they were isolated and just cut off from all the other countries. That is why cooperation is so continue. important. That is why nationalism, this idea that one country is better than another, so they shouldn't be interacting with other countries, that is why that is so harmful. That's why that hurts global stability. Because ultimately, countries are just worse off when we don't cooperate with each other. Now, going on to the third substantive argument on side proposition about how global nationalism actually undermines unity in the international community. The first layer of analysis here is that it results in a lot of political arms. What we see is that because it causes countries to isolate themselves, the reason they do this is because nationalists are now infiltrating these governments. We see that nationalist movements around the world are gaining more and more strength 
to the, in the United States, there are white nationalists that are having their messages being spread, and that minorities and the people that are the target of their harmful rhetoric are actually the ones that are losing out because policies are being made that are not favoring minorities and instead are harming them. But I hear. Don't you think it's unfair that you are depicting all nationalism on these? really minoritarian groups which are taking it to the most extreme levels and making it the most uh, We think horrible. that nationalism in and of itself is extreme. We think that the middle ground is very narrow because what the middle ground is, is patriotism. Remember, those things are distinct. We think that nationalism in and of itself is oftentimes not peaceful. That is why there's controversy surrounding it because people that are using things like violence, using things like hatred to get their messages across. What we see is that countries themselves, for example, North Korea is a very nationalist country. They're very isolated. They're very aggressive and violent. What we see is that when countries become so aggressive that they lack a regard for other countries' well-being. Because essentially, they're like, oh, hey, look, we are the best. Why do we care about other countries? Because we can do everything on our own. That's really dangerous because that just leads to the increases in tensions that Brian was telling you about. Increase in military tensions when we see countries that are just trying to make themselves more superior and kind of having this ego arms race kind of thing that's really been taking over the world. And the second layer here is that it leads to protectionist economic policies, which directly clashes with what uh, side opposition was talking about. When you have only a focus on your own interests, it means that only certain countries are able to be prosperous. That leads to an increase in global economic inequality. That is not stabilizing. Instead, all that does is keep widening the gap between the rich and the poor. So instead of coming to the middle and, be, and giving a solution that actually makes more people better off, only certain people get the privilege of being able to do that. That's what nationalism does. It doesn't care about cooperation or helping other people. All it cares about is about letting this specific minority group of people rise up among everyone else. The problem is that that makes our society much worse off because once you have those people having all the power, that is what leads to instability, that's what leads to resentment and an increase in tensions. That's why we ask you to vote with the proposition. A nation's strength ultimately consists in what it can do on its own and not on what it can borrow from others. That is why we're still convinced that global nationalism is not a threat to global stability but rather the country. During this speech, we first refute the points brought by the proposition, then move on to the third argument for our side on pledge of allegiance regarding to national identity. Let's first remember, though, that the team proposition today has to show us, firstly, that nationalist solutions, national solutions for current problems intrinsically generate conflict and, disrupt and disruption, and secondly, that internationalism is a better alternative for global stability. Now, before the refutations, very important clarification. We think that there's a distinction to be made between nationalist policies, those policies who want to help a country grow better, who want to prioritize their, their national interests in a very significant way, and just identity politics, sectarianism, racism outright. We don't think that all nationalism is extreme. In fact, we see that throughout history, nationalism has been a building force toward the creation of nations. And not all nations are extreme, not all nations' leaders were extreme. Gandhi is a great example of a nationalist who's not an extreme. So we see that it is a policy on their side saying Point. if it is not violent, then, it's nothing. then it is not a nationalist. We think that they have to talk about both of all of these cases. It's not just the extreme fringe minority which most benefits their case. Now, moving on to reputations on three main points. Militarism, discrimination, and cooperation. Starting with militarism. They tell you that since countries start prioritizing their own needs, they automatically hate on others and thus want to become expansionists. First, we don't see a clear link between prioritizing your own interests and feeling that your country is the best and trying to actively harm other nations. You can build yourself and improve as, uh, by your own without having to actively harm others. Secondly, we tell you that modern nationalism is more about independence. They themselves tell you about Brexit, about the possibility of retreating from the international community, having isolationism and the ability to have a recovery of sovereignty, not invading other countries. They tell you about Russia, for example. Russia didn't invade Crimea because it hates the Ukrainians, it invaded it because it wanted a port. It's nothing to do with the fact that they think sure. they are the best country in the world. Now, we think, moreover, that today, expansionism in the international community is not something to be, uh, that people want and that people see as something positive, but rather something that people should be ashamed of, and that would not be a, something that a nationalist would want for his country. 
Moreover, we tell you that tensions between states today are coming from forced political unions that don't work, from forcing countries to have different aims in the same, unity, in the same unions that may have different objectives, and that causes tension and friction between these countries. Second point of repetition regarding discrimination and fracture. They tell us that these nationalists only care about the ethnic original people from their land, and thus they would exclude minorities. We say that, that is not the truth. The truth. The truth is that nationalism provides a unifying factor for a country to thrive, a unifying idea to which everyone <laughs> can adhere and thus become part of that nation. India as a country exists only because Gandhi provided that idea of a national identity that didn't exist in the first place. Sir. We see again a difference between uh, nationalism and racism. The example of India that they bring themselves on how the Hindus hate on the Muslims is per perhaps religious extremism, but not nationalism. They are trying to confuse this issue, but they are not the same. No thing. And then they tell you, okay, but how, how do you reconcile under our civil nationalism the different ideas and ethnicities that people may have in a country? We give you having common political grounds and building up an identity from the ground. And we have Argentina as an example. Argentina is a country of immigrants. People from hugely different backgrounds came together, having a national identity, a construction of an idea of what it was to be an Argentinian, and thus we were able to thrive, thrive as a nation. So now we on to a third point of reputation regarding cooperation. They tell us that having an interconnected economy is much better for everyone because we are, we are able to trade and thus become uh, more uh, developed. We are not saying that we should abolish all trade whatsoever and be completely protectionist. We are advocating for countries trying pro to prioritize their interests and making perhaps more smart trade deals. We are against concepts like the Eurozone, in which there is a one-size-fits-all policy, for example regarding monetary policy, to which all countries have to adhere, but it is not fit for all countries, which inevitably leads to crises. And once those crises appear, these countries have not, do not have the ability to solve them by themselves. Greece is a very good example of that. Greece could have solved this crisis better had it been able to manage its interest rates. It couldn't because Germany was blocking it in the European Central Bank. So if Greece were able to manage its own economy, it would be able to recover from this crisis. This doesn't happen when you are forced to comply with a bigger political entity. So now, moving on to the third argument for the side of the, proposition, of the opposition. And why sustaining, valuing, and fomenting a distinct national identity is good for social stability. But before that, I would like to take a point if they haven't. Sure. Um, would you support Marine Le Pen's rhetoric of going to a true French identity at the cost of excluding immigrants, for example? I understand that point. We have to make a distinction between trying to, for example, uphold immigration laws that are already existent and saying that all Muslims should be completely abolished. We don't think that half of the French population is inherently racist, inherently hating on all this population, but rather perhaps they are tired of having a political union above them that limits their sovereignty to choose over their immigration policy. We think that's completely legitimate. Now moving on to the first layer of analysis, we wish to help to, on the ways to help your country. We tell you that while different cultures, cultures aren't inherently negative, having a national policies, uh, nationalist policy that embraces a uh, national culture is more than beneficial. We think that having a defined national identity allows individuals to have a strong feeling of identity between them and a bonding to their state and to their fellow citizens. This strong feeling of belonging adds to their morality and it becomes, makes them better citizens of that country. For example, if you care about your country more, then you are more willing to have it improve. You want you, you have bigger standards for your politicians, and that is why there is a very strong link between levels of nationalism and uh, lower levels of corruption. We are saying, for example, that people tend to follow the law because they are more compromised with the ideals behind that politi that that country and its policies. Overall, there is an added moral incentive if people follow a national identity, which makes them better citizens and makes their morality much better. Second layer, we tell you about cultural unity. We think that nationalism puts, puts forth values and ideas that define what it means to be part of a nation, and that provides a very important sense of unity. This unity is especially important when trying to, you, to make to get together a diverse population. Again, the example of India, which was originally a group of different ethnic groups that were brought together by the idea of the nation that didn't exist in the first place. We think that national identity also creates a universally accepted background for everyone to have a starting point on which they agree, on which they can reach political agreement. We see that, for example, the post-colonial Middle Eastern states were artificially drawn up, they had nothing in common with each other, they were not able to build a national identity, and that is one of the reasons why there is complete political turmoil in this nation. Overall, the, the existence of a national identity is better for these countries, and, I, and as it is, the idea of nationalism as a whole, that's why I'm convinced that we should ask not what your country can do for you, but we should ask what we can do for our country. When Russia annexed Crimea, 
They believed they were looking out for their citizens because they believed that Crimea was theirs and they believed that more power would protect the people of their country. When Marie Le Pen shouts racist things about Muslims and immigrants, she believes she's looking out for her version of the country. She believes that she's actually protecting citizens by protecting them from dangerous immigrants and Muslims who are there to kill everyone in the country. Nationalism is ultimately harmful because it's an extreme version of pride. Look at the way we use the word nationalism in the status quo. We use it to describe white nationalists who believe that their racial identity is superior to that of others. We use it to describe Hindu nationalists who believe that Muslims are inferior and should die. There is a difference between patriotism and nationalism, something that side opposition has failed to respond to. They have told you, historically, nationalism is pride in one's country, but it's not about how historically nationalism has been used as a word. It's about how it is used right now. Right now, nationalism is used to describe extreme pride that is harmful. We have to look at what it's used right now, because if nationalism was simply pride in one's country, it wouldn't be as controversial as it is today. We wouldn't be debating this topic if nationalism wasn't something to be discussed about whether or not it's beneficial or harmful. And for that very reason, nationalism is about the extreme ideologies we discuss. It's about believing your country is superior to another. That being said, let's start with the strategic error they've made before discussing the two fundamental questions of today's round. First, which side promotes countries' well-being? And second, which side promotes uh, in, uh, uh, global stability? That being said, let's start with the strategic error made by side opposition. We ask a very simple question. Why is nationalism required to create good economic and political decisions? Because the government can still protect citizens with or without harmful nationalism. They still have an obligation as a government to promote economic well-being and political well-being. It isn't based on pride or nationalism that a government does the things they do. They do the things they do because they don't want citizens to like live in poverty. They don't want people to be forced to like not be able to put food on the table. Nationalism is not required for economic policies no. that simply protect citizens. That being said, let's move down to the first question of which side promotes countries' well-being. They have two arguments here. First, they tell you that economic cooperation is bad because it ultimately harms countries' well-being. First of all, we've told you economic cooperation is good. Things like trade are beneficial towards countries. It's bad to pull out of trade agreements because those are the kinds of things that promotes your ability to access goods you couldn't in the first place. Take, for example, China. During around the period of the Great Leap Forward, China became incredibly isolationist in the way in which they dealt with trade. They refused to open up their borders and they didn't trade very much. And you know what happened? A famine. Millions of people died because China refused to engage in trade, because China was nationalist and believed that other countries could not help further their own ideology. The type of pride that they talk about is one in which countries refuse to engage and ultimately end up harming their own citizens. Second of all, it's also incredibly beneficial for developing countries who really need this kind of trade to promote their own well-being. We think that when they talk about isolationist policies, they don't talk about improving the economy. They talk about pulling out of the global economy, pulling out of all the beneficial trade deals that could have occurred. But second, third of all, we also tell you that countries can aid each other economically. When they give you the example of Greece having economic harms, Germany was the one that was able to bail Greece out. If Greece was left alone, they would have been, uh, they would have faced their harms alone. Madam, we think that the only way to protect citizens is therefore in our world. But second of all, we also tell you that they only protect certain individuals. They create a the us versus them complex where nationalism prioritizes one identifying factor. They say racism and ethnicity, uh, uh, arguments about ethnicity are distinct. But then why do we use the word nationalism in the context of white nationalists, Hindu nationalists? We think that their idea of nationalism is inherently flawed because it doesn't take into account the nasty side effects of nationalism. Even their own example of India being incredibly unified is kind of ridiculous considering you know, India has so many internal fractures, a lot of states are calling for secession, India is not unified in any way, shape, or form. They have incredible amounts of uh, parliament, uh, parliamentary parties that all argue with each other on a constant basis. Using India as an example is probably works better for our side when we talk about what nationalism is. Before I go on to the second question, I'll take a point. Madam, are we aware that the fact that the Greeks had a crisis in the first place is because of this integration that you are proposing? 
The integration was not caused the crisis. Inflation rates will exist with or without being in economic agreements. At the end of the day, you still have to use currency. You still have to have some semblance of trade. You still have to deal with world inflation rates in order to exchange goods. These economic agreements do not explicitly cause inflation. That being said, I'll discuss that when I talk about who promotes global stability. They say people feel like they lose sovereignty when forced into economic and political agreements. But in their case, the solution would just be pull out of every single economic and political agreement. What is the bright line when we stop listening to citizens complaining about losing sovereignty and stop or then began engaging in political and economic trade? We think that why is cooperation bad? Why is it bad that countries work together to create better economies overall? Wow. We think cooperation means you, you can help each other, you can have good trade, you can help developing countries who don't have the ability to create their own resources to help their own infrastructure. We think ultimately they haven't really answered this question. They can keep simply saying that nationalism is good, it's good to have pride, but they really haven't discussed why this pride means that trade deals are suddenly magnificent, why, uh, why isolationist policies create better trade deals. They haven't given you any examples of why isolationist policies create good trade deals. But they also didn't respond to the fact that nationalism creates interstate conflict. When you look at India and Pakistan, they're incredibly nationalist in the way in which they deal with each other. And the result is border skirmishes, people dying because India and Pakistan can't come to an agreement of how they should interact with each other because each believes they are superior to the other. Second of all, we also think this just increases aggression in general. When you're isolationist, you don't look about how other countries interact. You simply feel superior in your own country. A great example is North Korea, one of the most aggressive countries in the world because they are isolationist, because they refuse to engage, because they believe themselves to be superior. That is why they are so aggressive, because they don't believe that other countries can help or hurt them. They simply view them as pawns in their own game. Ultimately, the only thing proposition do opposition does is promote a world in which people refuse to cooperate, refuse to help each other, and ultimately destroy global stability. Thank you. We do not believe in the fallacious black and white world that Team Proposition is talking about in their free speeches, because we think that you can actually pull yourself up without putting other countries down. For that reason, we are still opposing the motion that global nationalism threatens global stability. In this debate, Team Proposition has failed to prove to you that nationalist solutions for current problems intrinsically generate conflict and disruption, and that internationalism is a better alternative for global stability. I will divide my speech first in a brief clarification on the concept of nationalism, and then on the two points of contention I have identified in this debate, which are the decrease in pensions and national stability. On the uh, class, uh, clarification in the concept of nationalism, they are talking about how they are supporting the pride in their country, but not the extreme concept of nationalism that they are talking about. But I actually see how this is an unfair mischaracterization of nationalism. Because we do not believe in this absolutist worldview in which nationalism is completely bad, we actually see that there are many uh, different benefits, and that actually part of nationalism is a sense of pride and support for one's country that they believe is not part of it. We've seen uh, in many different cases right. how this actually promotes unity within a country. And even if this were true, this event is not uh, about whether nationalism is good or bad, but the effect it has in global stability. And we have proven to you uh, in our three standard arguments well, the main reason for instability worldwide are the failures of internationalism as a whole and uh, this global trend that uh, actually causes nationalist governments to rise uh, looking for different solutions. Now, in our first part of contention on the decrease in pensions, there have been examples, for example, of uh, Brexit, the uh, and uh, they talk about militarization that is actually being promoted by nationalism. And what we are actually telling you is that the global nationalist trend that we have today is actually focusing uh, on looking uh, inwards Rather than on trying to uh, invade other countries, for example, if this were the case in non nationalist countries, we would actually like to see where the dismilitarization and invasion in other countries is in Poland or in the Philippines. Because this is not actually a problem that is intrinsic to nationalism, but rather aggressive policies that uh, are part of right. a foreign policy. No, thank you. And then they give an example on how, for example, Russia has annexed Crimea because of nationalism. We think that this is patently false. Because Russia having an imperialist uh, an imperialist foreign policy is not actually intrinsically related to nationalism. There are several different uh, countries that have uh, actually risen from nationalism and that have nationalist governments and do not actually conduct these aggressive measures against their neighboring countries. And then they talk about how nationalism intrinsically causes tensions and they bring the extreme example of North Korea. Which is told first, that this uh, example is actually an ex uh, extreme oversimplification of the concept of uh, nationalism. And the next, uh, on the situation in North Korea, because actually many of these uh, different problems and aggressive rhetoric 
in North Korea are the result of becoming a communist and a completely aggressive dictatorship rather than just plain nationalism. We think that nationalism is a completely peacefully viable solution. And we also tell you on this point how tensions actually exist currently among countries that are actually pursuing internationalist uh, policies and how this actually increases tensions in countries in the long run because they are forced to make compromises that in many cases don't even benefit either of the two countries and they are forced to do this because, for example, of economic uh, blocks such as the one yeah. in the European Union. Then they say how, for example, economic cooperation leads to countries becoming more united. So we told you that firstly, these one, si uh, one size fits all solutions do not actually bring forth holistic solutions for these countries, as they have completely different problems and interests. We, they have not contended with their points on, for example, Greece or Portugal being ex uh, extremely damaged by the policies of the European Union because they are forced to make extreme concessions. And secondly, we think that this uh, nationalism does not necessarily mean that countries will not help each other at all. It just means that they will prioritize their interests first and the interests of their own population rather than making extreme sacrifices in order point. to maintain this internationalist approach. And then they say that international agreements are good. First of all, they uh, they're lacking a lot of analysis on how all international agreements are intrinsically good, uh, because we told you that actually, in many different cases, these agreements actually disadvantage countries in many different yeah. relations. We see how in may, many developed countries, people actually have legitimate concerns about, for example, losing their jobs or several benefits because of these international agreements, and how in many different uh, developing countries People may have concerns about losing their sovereignty over uh, natural resources or uh, their own territorial sovereignty. So we do not actually think that international agreements are uh, necessarily all positive. And then they say on this example on Greece and Germany that when they had a crisis, the, this cooperation was beneficial because uh, Germany stepped in to help Greece. But what we actually tell you is that this is nothing but increased tensions between these two countries. Germany was extremely unsatisfied with having to bail Greece out, and actually this increased tensions between these two countries. On that. No, thank you. And secondly, we tell you that if these uh, countries weren't involved in the European Union in the first place, if they weren't being forced to make uh, decisions together despite having completely different uh, aims, they would not be having this problem altogether. Yes. Germany wasn't forced to accept the refugees like Greece or anything. In fact, nationalist sentiments have only resulted Sir, in anti-immigrant rhetoric. You're, you're completely misunderstanding our point on this matter. What we are telling you is that these countries have to engage in, poli in policies that are economically disadvantaging for both of them because they are forced to pursue the same, for, for example, monetary policy. This is not something that benefits them in the long run. And secondly, in the point of immigration, we think that actually these sort of solutions that, for example, the European Union wants to impose uh, the same possible solution on all member countries is actually extremely unfair because not all of these countries have the same capacities or needs. Point. No, thank you. So in this point, we have clearly proven to you how nationalism is not actually a threat to global stability, but rather the opposite and arises as a consequence of decreased stability as a whole. And the second point of contention in national unity, they systematically bring this point on how, for example, nationalism is the cause of uh, minorities being discriminated against and sectarianism and discrimination. Which we tell you that they are actually confusing nationalism with racism, sectarianism, um, religious extremism, and when they are not actually comparable, you can have nationalist, uh, nationalist population that are actually having these extreme cases of racism. On second, on a second answer, we tell you that actually the situation is completely different. Because nationalism actually functions to unify countries that have, for example, a variety of ethnic groups under common, for example, va uh, values that all of the population share regardless of ethnic origin. And this way we have uh, several countries uh, that are uh, whose population is uh, descended from immigrants, for example, such as the two countries debating here today, that actually have very consistent societies. And then they bring this point on how, for example, nationalism, uh, less a few people have all the answers to this problem. To which we say, firstly, they are failing to present their analysis on why this is the case, and secondly, we tell you that this is just false. Because nationalism actually creates a sense of cooperation between the country, because people actually want to see the country uh, becoming great, because it's, uh, it is also a moral matter, rather than just one approaching uh, economic interest, for example. So clearly, p uh, people that are pr uh, prideful in the country clearly have an incentive uh, to want to uh, achieve a cohesive and fair society. Because all of, this, uh, all of these reasons, and because nationalism is an intrinsically uh, uh, threat against global stability, we still hold true that you should not ask what your country can do for you, but rather what you can do for your country. If we truly seek global stability, we must once more be the masters of our faith and the captains of our soul. We still hold true that global nationalism is not a threat to global stability. So what have we seen throughout this debate? Three main questions for us. How do we reduce tensions? Who helps countries the most? And is nationalism inherently racist and divisive? 
And first, let's remember the team broke today. How to show with you that nationalist solutions for current problems are intrinsically conflictive and disruptive. And secondly, that internationalism is a better alternative overall. Question one regarding how do we reduce tension. They bring us to other speeches that the, the fact that people love their country, even if that love is, in a, is, a, is great and in an extreme way, that leads to people hating on other populations, on other nations, on other ethnicities. And that, in turn, according to the logic, leads to an expansionist policy. We tell you that in today's nationalism, which is the ground that they apparently want to debate, we see a bigger trend towards trying to isolate countries, trying to return to, uh, to gain sovereignty and withdraw from the international community, rather than trying to get more involved in the problems of other nations. Secondly, we tell you that it is unfair to bring every conflict in the world, every possible conflict and, and, clash, and clash, on the ideas of national pride and identity. We tell you, moreover, that it is, in many situations, the forced political union and the extreme integration that is a factor causing tension and friction in the international community. For example, the fact that the European Union forces the same regulations on 28 different countries with 28 different populations, ideas, and perspectives. So overall, this is one of the biggest causes of instability in, in, in today's world. And in any case, nationalism is a response, a reaction to that lack of sovereignty and lack of possibility to decide by ourselves. On a second question, who helps countries the most? They bring today that trade is a very important factor in development, in development and growth, and that's what you continue having very deep links between states regarding commerce. We don't say that all trade is bad and that we should completely shut down ourselves. But we say that internationalism has gone too far. We think that, that countries have made too many concessions in entering these economic unions, which has had a, num a number of negative consequences. For example, the limitation of sovereignty of countries regarding their monetary policies or their fiscal policies, which in turn makes it harder for them to solve their crisis. Moreover, we tell you that if there is such a big integration, the problems of one small state, even if it's irrelevant, can affect the whole and bring crisis to much larger scales. The example of Greece is exactly that, where one individual country caused 28 others to nearly collapse because of its inability to manage its economic problems. But then they tell us, okay, but if we withdraw from the international community and try to make smarter deals, as we tell you, you cease to help each other. So, okay, so let's see why nationalism has risen so far over the last year. You see populations like that in the United Kingdom, which have uh, felt that this economic integration is not beneficial either because they lose jobs or because they don't feel the benefits of the globalization that goes to, to the, top, the famous top 1%. So in any case, nationalism is a return to a balance in which countries try to recover some of the possibility of managing by themselves. We still can have bilateral agreements, smart agreements in trade. We are not shutting ourselves down, but we are rather trying to benefit the populations of this country, something that was not the priority in other times. Third question, is nationalism inherently racist and divisive? They tell us that if we have a national identity which is strong and well-founded, we inherently have to hate on other people. But we think that this is not the case. Many of the examples were, that were brought up during the debate have other rules. The India-Pakistan conflict is religious, for example. The US racism is a historic form of racism It has nothing to do with whether you like your country or not. The Russian problem is plain imperialism. Overall, we don't think there's a clear link between these two things. But moreover, we tell you that having clear unifying ideas for the population is beneficial because it can give individuals something to share with others in the same population, thus reducing internal conflicts, providing a common ground for agreements and consensus to the region. Overall, nationalism is not inherently disruptive, but rather it's a necessity, it's a, it's a necessary change in a world which is growing increasingly in aid. And thus, we tell you that ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. Throughout this debate, side opposition has given you a utopian ideal of what nationalism looks like. They tell you that nationalism includes the love of your country. But remember what Ryan told you in his first speech. You can have a love of your country, but don't load other countries in the process. That's what nationalism does. It takes the love of the country, it warps it, and it takes it to the extreme. Look at the context at which the term nationalism is being used. It's being used with Russia trying to annex Crimea because it wants to strengthen Russia's identity. It's being used when Marine Le Pen makes disparaging comments against immigrants and Muslims in France because to her, those people aren't part of the true French identity. It looks like the conflict between India and Pakistan, where nationalism is so high on both sides that it's frowned upon to even talk to people from that other country. 
It is because this animosity is what ultimately creates this instability in society. That is why we ask you to vote with the proposition. In this speech, I'm going to be boiling this debate down into the big clash point, which is going to be that about cooperation versus isolationism as caused by nationalism. So their best argument is basically that nationalism allows for smarter trade deals. We think that this is first quite insignificant, uh, considering that we've given you arguments about how you have military conflict that's increasing. Countries are lifting themselves up above other countries. They're trying to take over other countries. They're trying to make themselves seem superior. Seems like having smarter trade deals doesn't really link to this topic. But even if it did, we think that their argument that nationalism somehow magically improves these trade deals is pretty ludicrous. Because what nationalism does is it basically just boosts these countries' ego, right? What we see is that the reason that these trade deals are failing is because each country thinks that it's never going to be good enough for that country's interests. What nationalism does is it prevents the possibility of compromise. That is why these economic deals might be failing, and nationalism definitely does not do anything to stop that. They say that global integration has been the one to cause crises. But it's not global cooperation that made, uh, made, that made some of these deals go south. It's nationalistic tendencies that caused them to fail. For example, they say that Germany was the one that tried to shut out Greece and that's what called the recession. Shreya contests this by saying it was just inflation that caused it. But even if we take them at their highest ground, even if we think that Germany was the one that caused it, why did Germany try to shut out Greece? It's because they were nationalists, because they wanted to lift their country above that of Greece. It is nationalism that is poisoning these deals, not cooperation. And even if there were some trade deals that kind of went south, it doesn't mean global cooperation as a whole is bad, it just means that those particular trade deals probably need to be fixed. We don't think it's that big of a deal in this round. The second reason is because we think that cooperation is better because it creates a safety net for countries. This is why one country going down doesn't hurt all the other countries, because the other countries are unified in helping get that country and helping them improve so that the global economy and that the global international community isn't actually hurt. The second reason is that you get a better exchange of goods when we cooperate. You know, you get better food, you get other goods that you might not be able to create in your own country, but you can get them overseas. We think that those benefits are also lost in the world of side opposition. And we think that by getting rid of this nationalism, it fosters a higher likelihood of compromise and unity. Because when countries are working together on political and economic alliances, it means there's a less likely chance that conflict's going to break out. Why would you attack any of your neighbors? Why would you attack any of your allies if they're helping you? That's our world. Countries help each other. So countries aren't as likely to attack each other either. That's how we decrease conflict. That's how we make countries better off. Because in a world of nationalism, it's every country for themselves. In a world where you have internationalism and cooperation, we think that countries can work together to lift up each other, in turn, lifting up themselves. That's why we ask you to vote for the proposition.